Hey guys, welcome to Myth and Mission. The idea of this particular study session series is that we dive into different categories of thought. Think about humans, or God, or creation. What does our hope look like? And what we're going to do is we're going to dive into the ancient world around the Bible to show you how utterly unique the scriptures are in their own cultural context. But we won't stop there either. We're going to take a look at more contemporary assertions of these things and really just dive into the fact that the Bible's message is just as subversive, amazing, and hopeful as it was then as it is today. This is the intersection between myth and mission, where we are attempting to learn the language of our cultural milieu and to bring the biblical worldview into purview. Um, we're gonna start first by opening up the question of what is a human? What is it about humanity that is or isn't special? You see, we all have ideas about humans, about people, about their worth, about whether there's stratifications of human worth, about what our mission is, what are we supposed to be here for, what is human purpose. We can call this topic, theologically speaking, an anthropology, what it means to be human. So the ancient world around the Bible had answers for this topic. And for this, we're going to dive into an ancient Babylonian creation myth called the Enuma Elish. This is an old story about conflicts between gods that ultimately resulted in the fashioning of humankind. So we're going to turn to the Enuma Elish tablet number six and look here at the origin story of humans. Let me set the stage real quick. The Enuma Elish as a creation story talks about something we're going to dive into a little bit later, that this cosmological battle between different deities resulted in the chaos dragon goddess Tiamat being slain and her body being used as kind of the fabric of the earth. And so all of these gods were involved in some form or fashion in this warfare, and the Babylonian patron god Marduk and his crew won the day. So all of these names are referring to different deities within the Babylonian pantheon. Here we pick up in the conversation with the gods deciding what to do afterwards. Kingu is the one who instigated warfare, who made Tiamat rebel and set battle in motion. They bound him, holding him before A. They inflicted the penalty on him and severed his blood vessels. From his blood, he created mankind, on whom he imposed the service of the gods and set the gods free. After the wise A had created mankind, he had imposed the service of the gods upon them. That task is beyond comprehension. Okay, so hold up. Around the time that the Bible's audience would have been around, there was a story that claimed this, that humans came as an afterthought of this cosmological warfare because the gods needed some slaves, some servants to do their work. So if we were to boil down the view of the Numa Elish, this is what we could say. Not only are you an afterthought, but you are an enslaved blood clot. What? Yeah, guys, you see the, the cultures around Israel at the, the time that they were coming to being had this kind of answer for what it meant to be human. Is anybody else a little unsatisfied with that answer? Do you believe this? Do you believe this answers the ultimate question as to who you are and what you're here for? I'm a little unsatisfied too. So why don't we take a look at the neighbor of Babylon, at the answers we receive in the book of Genesis. This is Genesis 1, 26 through 31. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, 
over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Okay, does anybody think this story is just a little bit different? There's no conflict here. There's no sense that humanity is an afterthought. But instead, it's leading up to, all of creation leads up to the crowning moment, the pinnacle of creation. He saved the best for last. And what was it? It was humanity. Do you see the intentionality of God. Yahweh, the God of the Hebrew scriptures, is creating humanity with great intention. And what is this image and likeness concept? We often explore this here at the Heart Youth. This is being made in the image of God and likeness of God. It's a word pair that means that you're kin with God. Look at Genesis 5.3 and the same word pair is used, associated in the relationship between Adam and his son Seth. This is a kinship relationship. You're a child of God. Image of God was an idiom used of royalty that kings would fashion themselves as the, the children or the images of, of deities. And so this is language of kingship as well. And still, this idea of an image, a cult image, not something uh, that is a reflection per se, but something that you, you would picture a statue as what you would have in your mind. These were cult images. In other words, uh, an image resided somewhere in the temple of a deity. It was going to represent that God's presence in that temple. And that's the word that the Genesis author picks up. And so where this cultic statue, this living representation, this priestly presence of God mediating his presence to the world. This is a high order indeed. This is a high view of humanity. This is, as theologians would call it, a high anthropology. Are you guys feeling meaningful and purposeful? You feel like God made you on purpose? You're not an afterthought. You're not a blood clot meant to, to do some slave work. You are made in the image and in the likeness of God. Isn't that wonderful? So how do we boil that down? Well, you could put it like this. You are a royal child of God. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Guys, cherish this. The scriptures, the, the, they say that th th this is who you are. And if you think about all the things in your life that attempt to treat you less than that, to commodify you, to devalue you, to question your worth, to stratify humans based on systems of economy or race or whatever the system is that people try to make gradations of who is on top and who is worth less, the Bible has a firm and corrective answer to that kind of thinking, that kind of twisted, fallen anthropology. You are a royal child of God, and he made you on purpose, burdened with glorious purpose, as Loki would say. I am Loki of Asgard, and I am burdened with glorious purpose. And I think we need to cherish that. Now, this message that, that you're on purpose, that God has made you to be part of his family, his royal priestly family, 
this message isn't just subversive and challenging for the ancient ears. It's challenging for us today. So what I'd like to do is take a moment to look at a contemporary text, one that shapes us even today in our context, and see how the scriptures rebuke it. Are you ready? We're going to look for the twisted anthropology in America's founding documents. Let's take a look at the Declaration of Independence. It starts pretty well. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, uh, for those of us today, assuming perhaps maybe this men is just a stand-in word for like all of humanity, maybe that's the point we'd pick. But I, I want to demonstrate that in America's founding documents, that group that are created equal according to the Declaration of Independence, which we would affirm, well... It's actually more selective than that, if we're really attentive to the Founding Fathers. Here we go. Further down the Declaration, here's what we read about the King of England. He has incited domestic insurrections among us, and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers the merciless Indian savages, whose known rule of warfare is an indistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. Did you catch that? That... The native people, the indigenous people of North America, are deemed in the Declaration of Independence as savages, meaning they are not a part of that group that is assumed in the all men are created equal. Now, I might be accused here of, of being a little fine tooth comb, but I think American history shows that America's founding documents indeed are not for the life, liberty, pursuit of happiness of the people of whom we stole land and, and contributed in, in a genocidal effort and re intentional removal of the indigenous people who lived here. They then, by virtue of proved and lived anthropology, according to the Americans' founding documents, and are not included in the all men are created equal. So while the language is great, the rhetoric is great, we can agree with the rhetoric that all, hopefully men and women, we're going to get there, are created equal, the lived experience has not shown to be true. In other words, America, too, is captive to a twisted anthropology. Let's move on, shall we? Let's go to the Constitution. Article 1, Section 2. Representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states which may be included within this union according to their respective numbers, which shall be determined by adding to the whole number of free persons, including those bound to service for a term of years, and excluding Indians, not taxed, three-fifths of all other persons. You may be familiar with what's known as the three-fifths clause or the three-fifths compromise. This is referring to the slave population, predominantly slaves from Africa. In other words, the black population of America was considered three-fifths human when it comes to counting how many humans are in each state. So this is an uncomfortable part of our history, but we have to own it and see that bad anthropology continues to shape discourse today. You see, theologians like Mark Charles and Sung Chan Ra, I'm going to read a little bit from their really great book called Unsettling Truths, and they're going to help us diagnose the weak anthropology of America's founding documents, which ultimately are a theological assertion. Here we go. Beginning in Article 1, Section 2, women are never mentioned as having representation in the federal government or as beneficiaries of that government. In the Constitution, from the preamble through the 27th Amendment, there are 51 gender-specific male pronouns. When referring to who can run for office, who can hold office, and even who is protected by this Constitution, not a single female pronoun is used. Next, indigenous people are explicitly excluded. And finally, all other persons, i.e. black slaves, are counted as three-fifths human. This article reduces those in the we the people primarily to white land-owning men, and so the Constitution of the United States was originally written to protect the interests of white land-owning men. 
Women didn't get the right to vote until 1920, an outcome of the women's suffrage movement. The entirety of the native community didn't become citizens until 1924, and in some states like Arizona and New Mexico, didn't get the right to vote until 1948. Jim Crow laws were still written after the 14th Amendment. Indian boarding schools were established after the 14th Amendment. Lynching, Indian removal, internment camps, segregation, and mass incarceration of people of color, all of these and more took place after the 14th Amendment. And in 1970, the 14th Amendment was used in Roe v. Wade, which concluded unborn babies are not human enough to be considered a person by the Constitution and therefore could be aborted. There is an affront to anthropology even in our own country, guys. We need to hear that. So, by virtue of the exclusions, by virtue of the language set up that is intentional and, and the lived experience of these texts, we know that America struggled with living up to the ideals of a high anthropology, supposedly espoused by biblical norms. And so, I perhaps ungenerously and obtusely, I must summarize the anthropology of America's founding documents as follows. You aren't fully human if you aren't a white landowning man. What? Yeah, no, I, I, I'm not saying it says that explicitly. I'm saying it says that implicitly. And, and this is the thing. A weak anthropology, a, a view of humanity that is less than what the Bible espouses is going to stratify people. It's going to break people. It's going to warp people. It's going to set up hierarchies that don't need to be there. And ultimately, it's going to leave a wake of destruction. And if we're honest about our history, America has no clean hands here. We haven't lived up to an anthropology that the Bible aspires to. And so no matter what context we're in, if we're in ancient Babylon or if we're in modern day America, the Bible's message that each and every human being, no matter of their function, their status, their race, their creed, their ability, are made in the image and likeness of God that they are born to be, to be, they're, they're tell us, they're in game. Well, the reason they're here, the glorious purpose they're burned with is to be a child, a royal child of God representing him to the cosmos. That is a subversive message no matter what era you're in. And it's one we need to keep close. It's one we need to proclaim. It's one that gives us fuel for mission that we need to demonstrate, to announce, to live by this glorious anthropology. Because by it, people can come to know the one true God and find life and meaning and purpose. The message is just as urgent as it was in the context of Babylon as it is today in our own context. We need to tell people how beloved they are by God, born to be a part of his family. We need to tell people that they don't have to strive or be someone else to be of value. That by virtue of being made in the image of God, they are royal. This is something Disney has right, that, that everybody's a prince or princess, right? The Bible would affirm that. You're of immeasurable value and dignity and worth to the living God of the creator of the universe. And you indeed are invited to be redeemed, to represent him and his reign throughout the cosmos. That you are invited in co-regency, that, that you get to participate in the kingdom of God. The world needs to hear a biblical anthropology. They need to hear your fellow brothers and sisters around the world need to know how cherished they are by God and how beautiful the dignity, the glorious purpose they have in Him. So would you join us in announcing this and living this and cherishing it to our own hearts, holding to the biblical truth and proclaiming it with our lives even when we have to rub against the broken anthropologies of our day, we can proclaim and live into our identity as royal children of God. This is the opportunity to reinvest ourselves in the myth, if you will, of the Bible. I'm not saying that in a way that diminishes the truth of it, but this is what shapes our imagination, what shapes our reality, what shapes our inner dialogue, what shapes our truth. 
And when we cherish and we believe and we walk into that truth, God is gonna empower us to live on mission with him, to proclaim to the world how cherished it is to God. For God so loves the world. Are you with me? Let's do this. Let's let our myth lead us into mission and challenge the world around us and the world within. Godspeed.